Hello and welcome to another episode of The Brothers Discuss. I am Alex. And I am Chris. Chris, we don't have to talk about those goddamn mutants anymore. We can talk <laughs> about some other movies. Finally. <laughs> okay, so the first movie that we're going to talk about today, just a little bit of catching up. Uh, it is Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire. What did you think of this? Uh, I thought it was pretty much exactly what I expected, which was it's the dumbest movie of all time, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a pretty fun popcorn movie. I mean, I didn't mind the first one, the, the 2021 film, but this kind of leaned into the um, the over-the-topness a little bit more. Uh, I mean, Dan Stevens was in it, and he was very funny. Uh, I had a good time with it, so if you want a big, mindless action film with monsters... It does what it advertised. Um, <laughs> it's not Godzilla minus one. Just know that going in. All right. Uh, Chris, I believe you have seen a TV show. Why don't you talk to us about that? So, yeah, I watched the Fallout TV show. I'm a little late to the game. Uh, I think it started, like, in March or April. And uh, I only got around to it this summer. But so this is based off of the video game Fallout franchise, which I'm not, like, two and two i've played four and like i've dabbled a little bit in three in new vegas mm. for those of you who know your fallout stuff like that's all i've really done so like i'm kind of familiar with like the techniques of the world and th and this is pretty much that you know you have your vault dwellers and your ghouls and all of that um but one thing i love about the fallout franchise is that like there's at least to my knowledge there's never been like a direct sequel it's just been a bunch of series of games all taking place different parts of the country, different characters. And uh, that's exactly what you get with this TV show. And I'd say it's definitely, definitely worth a watch. It was, um, it, it's hard to get video game adaptations like that. And even if you're not familiar with Fallout, I do think it's like still really good based off the performances and uh, really the direction. One thing I wasn't expecting is that like your two main characters, you would think they'd be like a duo from the start but they really don't, like, start, you know, buddying up until, like, halfway through the show, which was pretty interesting to me. Um, and there's a really great focus on, like, this secrecy with Vault Tech, which you don't really get as the forefront for the other games. So, um, yeah, really great performances, especially, um, God, I can't remember his name, but um, <laughs> Google. Oh, him. Yes, him. <laughs> Uh, he was in uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. He was, like, the... Oh, uh, like... Walton Doggins? Yes, Walton Doggins. He's in He's in this. He's very good. Ah, in show. okay. So um, I would definitely recommend watching it. And, uh, yeah, even if you're not familiar with the games, it's worth a solid watch. Lots of dark humor, by the way, which I love. Uh, so really great stuff. Cool. I'll have to check that out. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is going to be a, uh, I guess... Round one of what I'm calling the lightning round reviews, where <laughs> I've seen a bunch of movies that you have not seen, so I'm going to do very, yes. very quick reviews, get through them. Okay, first up is Late Night with the Devil. Uh, great film. Um, okay, quickly, right off the bat, yes, there is AI used in the film, but it's very, very, very brief. And it, it's kind of funny that this caused such a large stir because it's so minuscule in the movie, its usage, that... I don't think I would have even known, uh, but therein lies the problem. They're they're used as like bumpers because the movie is like you're watching a television production of this late night talk show. So the bumpers, so it's the bumpers between the commercials for a couple of them. It's like when you look closely, it's like a skeleton, and there's like jack o' lanterns around him, and you notice the skeleton's fingers are all like twisted, and the jack o' lanterns like the eyes don't look right, and it's like okay, that is typical AI. So I do have to say I don't want to see that sort of thing continue. Um, and I think the filmmakers really regret it. Uh, but a lot of people review bomb them. But in terms of the movie itself, there's just so much creativity. There's so much innovation. Uh, I thought it was really good, really interesting, super different. And David Dasmalchian is so good in it. And as this, like, late-night talk show host, and it's really worth going out of your way to see. So... Really good movie. I've seen it twice now, actually. Um, so I saw a scary movie. I saw The First Omen. I've never seen The Omen, so this was my first omen. 
Uh, uh, good movie. A uh, good, scary, creepy movie with a great lead performance and really interesting themes. I enjoyed watching it. And I don't know what else I can really say about it besides it was just a good, creepy movie. So, yeah, you can check that out as well if you want to, if you want to see a good, spooky film. Um, next, I saw the I saw Monkey Man. So, Dan Patel uh, made a movie where he looks like a total badass, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, the representation in the film is interesting because I didn't know that going in. Like, I, didn't, I don't really, I don't really think about what trans people go through in a non-first world country. Like, I thought it was really good. I and I really like revenge movies. I'm an action aficionado in that sense, and I thought this was really creative. It did some different stuff, uh, cinematography wise and fight style wise. Uh, this is, it is essentially a vanity project for Dev Patel. And I mean, at the end of the day, he gets his ass kicked a lot. Uh, this is not like The Rock and Vin Diesel and those guys. Like, they're bulletproof, but you care about his character because he does get his ass kicked a lot. And, I mean, his character is kind of like in this underground shoot fighting league, I guess. And, I mean, we get like an almost Rocky-like comeback training and everything. Just great action, nice visuals, good performances. All right. Uh, next I have is uh, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Um, I thought this was a fine movie. Uh, I think it was advertised in a tone that the movie does not really have. You know, it's like very fast-paced. Uh, it's set to Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. It looks it looks like it was just full of action, and it's really not. Uh, there are action scenes, but it's not full of action. It's a lot more of an espionage film. It's, it's, it's a fine espionage film, but it's quite straightforward, and everyone in it is good. Uh, Guy Ritchie knows how to make a movie, but it, it's just fine. It's one of those things I'm already forgetting about, so that's a shame. Uh, a lot of people have compared it to Inglorious Bastards, and it's really not even the same league as that. All right, that's the end of uh, Lightning Round Part 1. Uh, now we can talk about a movie we've both seen, and that is Civil War. Not the Captain America film. Uh, the Alex <laughs> Garland A24 film. Chris, what did you think of this one? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. I don't know if I really fell in love with the movie. Um, obviously, like, just the uh, the visual nature of the movie, it's, you know, very artistic and out there. And uh, this is kind of like A24's, I guess, like, big first, big budget movie. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think did a really great job with that. And... Um, not I don't I just don't have like too much to say about it. There's it nothing like really a lot of scenes stood out, but the whole movie itself didn't really blow me away. Okay. Uh I thought it was a very, very good movie. Uh mm. Alex Garland in recent years, I guess, has been a little divisive with some of his films. Not everybody liked men. I thought that movie was very well made. Uh some people were divided as well on Annihilation a few years ago. But I thought that was great as well. And so it's kind of like Everyone really likes Ex Machina, and they like some of the films that he wrote, like 28 Days Later and Sunshine and Dread, uh, which Carl Urban said he should have gotten proper directing credit on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, everyone likes Ex Machina, and then they haven't liked the films he's made afterwards. And it, it kind of sounds like he's kind of hanging up the boots, so to speak. Yeah, but, and that is unfortunate, because I, I, I do think he's very talented. Even if this wasn't, like, completely for me, I, I still enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was great. I mean, there's not an explanation as to why America is divided like this and why, you know, it's like a hell world that everyone's living in, but that's that's not really important to the story. We're just following these journalists, and we're kind of mm -hmm. following them in a way that we, you know, journalists should be doing their jobs in a sense that they're not really taking a side. And a lot of people have seen this as, like, an agenda of the left, or this is sympathizing <laughs> with the right, or, like... No. <laughs> That's not really what the film is about at all. It's just about journalists documenting what's happening, and it doesn't matter it's, what happens to the people around them. They're just – they're document. It's a road trip movie. It's the best road trip movie since Logan. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It, I just found it really fascinating, and then they find themselves in a predicament where they, they themselves are in serious danger, and then things change for some of the characters. I mean, uh, Kirsten Dunst's character is very kind of hard-nosed and doesn't really take a side. And she's just there to do her job, and something happens where she then starts to see things in a different light, and then she kind of becomes more of a person as a result. 
Uh, I mean, we, meanwhile, we've got this younger character that really looks up to Kirsten Dunn's character, and she is very naive to the job and to the world, and we see a lot through her eyes as well. And I mean, Alex Garland's films all look really good, but this had some very interesting character stuff. And he himself, you know, not really taking a side story-wise or politically, I mean, the characters also do that as well. So we're kind of meant to just see what it's like to have that job. So, um, yeah, it was just very, very, very good in my opinion. Mm-hmm. People were looking to get some kind of political analysis out of the film, and it's not really there besides, you know, war is bad, maybe. Yeah. is one of the things you can take away from it because n- nobody wins. Uh, but the president is played by Nick Offerman, and what his side is isn't really shown. But, I mean, if you want to look at it as the president is kind of depicted as a little bit of a coward, I mean – that can be pinned to any president, really. Even the one you <laughs> like, listener. Uh, I don't think it's as deep as people are trying to make it out. That that it, it, it and in that sense, it is kind of like men, the, uh, the movie, not the gender. Uh, but men are a simple species. Uh, but yes, Civil War is very good, uh, and I, I I believe we would both recommend it. Oh yeah, I would recommend it. Perfect. Uh, then I saw. Abigail. Oh, this is oh, round two of my lightning round, round by two. the way. Okay, so let me speed through these. Uh, Abigail. Uh, this, this is the movie about the vampire ballerina, and I really didn't like that movie that much. <laughs> there were elements that I liked. Uh, Dan Stevens is a very charismatic person, and I liked his performance a lot. The Blob is also in it. Uh, he's having a bit of a comeback. Uh, Kevin Durand. Uh, he's, he's also in the new Apes movie, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I didn't like Abigail that much. Uh, there were some cool effects in it, some cool set pieces, but yeah, I was kind of bored throughout a lot of it, and a lot of the comedy didn't work. And it's it's from the writers, directors who did Ready or Not, which I did really, really like. So it wasn't quite that kind of... It kind of felt like maybe they had access to some higher-named actors this time or something, so they got, like, they got the likes of Catherine Newton, for example, who... I'm just a little confused by why everyone's on her bandwagon. I, I just, I, I don't need to be so blunt about it, but I just don't think that she's very good. I mean, I've seen her in this, Detective Pikachu, Blockers, and Ant-Man, and I just haven't thought that she's that great in any of them. Uh, anyway, uh, that was Abigail. Uh, oh, I lied, actually. There is one movie that we have both seen. Uh, we're gonna, we're going to talk about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Why don't you take this one? Okay, so this was um, I didn't really have too much anticipation in this. I was kind of more intrigued of like, what do you do with the fourth one after you know Matt Reeves' films? And um, I was like very pleasantly surprised with this movie. There was a lot more going on in terms of like the world than I thought there would be because. This isn't really a direct sequel to those movies. Like, it, there are mentions of Caesar, but um, not really spoilers. They kind of say this in the marketing. It, it takes place, like, hundreds of years later after Caesar. So um, I kind of like that there's all these different branches of, like, what people think of Caesar. And, um, you know, and some apes don't even know about Caesar. I, the main character's ape, Noah, he doesn't know anything about that, and... Um, I feel like that's a really good direction if you're trying to introduce a new audience to the Apes franchise. And, um, yeah, overall, I was really surprised with this, and I'm excited to see more. I am too, actually. Uh, yeah, I actually I actually quite like this uh, quite a bit. I didn't expect to really think, because I thought that the Matt, it's not really the Matt Reeves trilogy, but that the Caesar trilogy, I guess, is what you could probably call it, was really good. It was really a nice way to reboot the franchise in the modern era. And, yeah, I, I really don't have much to say. I, I just really like this. I could just watch a whole movie of apes just traveling through the forest all day. It, it was <laughs> Apes on horses. It's just the yeah, best thing ever. <laughs> it, it really is, honestly. I really love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think you nailed it. This is, really good, this is a really good movie, and I would recommend it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I won't recommend is Unfrosted, the Jerry Seinfeld Pop Tarts movie. Um, this was rubbish. I mean, 
the only reason I'm really talking about it is because of his big talk about the, the anti woke stuff of like, you know, we get we, we can't do comedy anymore, and it's like I've seen some very good comedies in recent years, and this is an example of like there are jokes in the movie, there are just none of them are very funny. And comedy is subjective, but I just I was waiting for something funny to happen, and I mean. It's kind of super embarrassing, this movie. I, I remember when it was announced, like, Jerry Seinfeld and Amy Schumer and Melissa McCarthy, and I'm like, oh, God, this sounds like the movie from hell. And then it's, like, all this list of other actors that I like, like Hugh Grant, James Marsden, Max Greenfield. I, I like all those people. It's an all-star cast. I mean, somehow they convinced John Hamm to play Don Draper in the movie. It, yeah, it just really wasn't funny. It's, you know, just the most embarrassing thing that I could, I think most of these actors have been in. And for Jerry Seinfeld to go out there and say that it's really hard to make comedy because you can't be funny anymore. And it's like, maybe you just weren't funny, sir. Maybe Larry David was the funny one. But this is rubbish. I, I just want to talk about this in connection to Baby Reindeer, which both of these things are on Netflix. And Baby Reindeer is this series that a lot of people are talking about, and sometimes these things get overhyped when something takes hold of public consciousness and everyone's talking about it. Uh, Baby Reindeer is a really, really good show. It, it takes a subject matter that can be difficult to talk about and talks about it in this very blunt and no-bones-about-it way. Uh, just really, really good series. Uh, this this guy, it's based on his life where... He was stalked by this woman that he showed a little bit of kindness to. Then he makes some very bad decisions along the way. It, it, it's not like he's totally innocent in this. He, he kind of addresses that. But he's this stand-up comedian who thinks he's going to be getting his big break with this writer-producer guy who takes disliking to him. And some really terrible things happen. And then this also relates to what's happened in the past. And now this is connected to this thing that's happening in the present where this woman just sends him hundreds and hundreds of emails a day and yeah just really really good show and I, I don't really want to say much more about it because i went in very blind to what it was about but it's gonna be it's just the one season so if you're worried about i've got to commit to the show which I, I definitely do think about sometimes this is not that this is a standalone like i think it's like seven episodes or something and they're about half an hour each so it's it's a pretty easy watch in terms of length. It, it's a very hard watch in terms of the subject matter, but a very, very good show. All right. Uh, so next up, I saw The Challengers. Uh, so I'm going to say this. I thought this was really poorly advertised. So not only does it kind of make people think that the movie might be about the threesome or something, it, it, it kind of is. I mean, that's that's the catalyst for everything that happens. But I thought that the trailers made this look really bad. And I honestly had no interest in seeing this because I thought it looked really bad. But its perception was really, really strong. So I'm glad I saw this in the end. It's very good. It's going to wind up, I think, as one of the best films of the year for, uh, to most people. A lot of great tension and the three leads, the, the lead, three lead performances are very good. And I guess... The relationship that the three of them have with each other is really strong and well-defined. Uh, but the camera work and the music, the score, there's something else. Um, <laughs> it's very overbearing at times, uh, to the point where, in a different type of movie, you'd be like, oh my god, what is this score? But in this, like, it, it was like representative of what was going on. And just, what a surprise. I mean, this was not on my anticipation at all as a movie that I would really like, but I'm glad that I did. It was very cool to see something like that. Uh, again, so, so different to anything else. Uh, so I would recommend Challengers. All right, next up is The Bike Riders. And you haven't seen this, right? No, not yet, at least. All right. So uh, I'll be brief. It, it kind of reminds me of Drive in the sense that people went into this thinking it was going to be like, a Fast and Furious movie, and it's not that. And people could go into this thinking it's going to be like this, like this insane battle of the bikers or something like that instead. It's not. It's a character drama. It breaks down, like, a toxic masculinity theme as well. So I 
I would recommend it. And, you know, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy doing a funny voice is, like, my favorite subgenre in, in film. So I would recommend it in that sense. Uh, but a movie we both saw is Inside Out 2. All right, Chris, I'll let you start this one. Okay, so um, definitely, like, one of the more interesting Pixar movies that we've had lately in terms of, like, just going into it. It's, like, I didn't know exactly how to feel about the concept of an Inside Out sequel because uh, I think you had a really good thing with the first one. And the issue with the sequel is that the first one was really, really good. One of the best Pixar movies ever made. And um, so I, I think I did watch this twice, and I'm really glad I watched this twice because the first time I watched it, I had watched the first movie right before it uh, or the night before. And that kind of, that did raise the bar unbelievably high for the second one. And that was my biggest thing watching the second one is that it's no Inside Out one. <laughs> But on a second viewing, I was kind of able to push that to the side and really enjoy this for what it is. Um, it, it's not perfect. It's not amazing. But it is really solid and fun. And, again, in terms of, like, what we've had for Pixar lately, this is one of the better ones. Probably the best since Soul, I'd say. Okay. And, um, yeah, I, I, I just really enjoyed this. It, it is kind of a shame that some of the characters got recast. Um, but, you know, overall, like, it still has that spirit that the first movie had. I don't think the themes are quite as heavy in this as it is in the first one, uh, but it's still really fun and, you know, really great performances. I love My Hawk as, um, as Anxiety, and all the new emotions are really fun to watch, too, even though Anxiety definitely has, uh, the spotlight in this movie, but, uh, still pretty solid. I enjoyed this a lot. So... I didn't like it as much as the first, uh, but the first is arguably as good as like the, the golden era of Pixar in the 2000s. You know, like you've got uh, Toy Story 2 to Monsters, Inc. to Finding Nemo to The Incredibles to Ratatouille to Wall-E to Up to Toy Story 3. I skipped Cars. Uh, sorry, Cars. Uh, <laughs> that run of movies uh, besides Cars, it, it, it's so strong. I mean... <laughs> Uh, there was a joke at the Oscars years ago that one year where Jack Black was saying, like, I take all my money from my DreamWorks paycheck and I bet it all on Pixar on Oscar night. I mean, Pixar was making a lot of great stuff. I don't think they've quite been at that point ever again. Uh, not to say that they haven't made great films, but the more recent run of films, I mean, I haven't even seen all of them. You know, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I liked Turning Red. and I liked Soul. Uh, Luca was fine. I, I didn't like Onward that much. You know, Incredibles 2 was good, but not as good as the first. Coco was good. Um, oh, and Lightyear. I fucking forgot they made Lightyear. Jesus. <laughs> I forgot about it, too, and I actually did see it. <laughs> no, and I haven't seen Lightyear. But anyways, like, when I watched the first Inside Out, I was like, that's a very clever way to explain emotions to a child. Like, mm-hmm. when sadness starts, like, touching all of these memories, and it's like, yeah, that's an interesting way to explain sadness or feeling joy to a kid. Like, or, like, I really liked when Riley constantly has that bubblegum commercial jingle in her head. And it's like, yeah, that happens to me. Like, what is that? So I really like that in the first one. In this one, I mean, it is a little bit more of the same. But I do think that the, uh, the anxiety stuff isn't going to hit very hard for kids, uh, like for literal children like it will for people like us. And, and then I say, I, you know, I say that, but my theater was, was packed and there were hardly any children in it. So like, yeah, who's this for? I, I guess it's just for the kids that watched this and grew up with that and are, and are experiencing those emotions. So I, I guess it's clever in that way, but I do agree. I mean, at the end of the day, this is still a kid's movie, but I've said that a lot the past few years, you know, Spider-Verse movies. It's like, those are kids movies and kids can certainly watch them. But there are there's a lot that's going on in those movies that are a lot more geared towards adults. And yeah. I kind of get the same vibe from this movie. Not nearly as strong, but I get that same vibe. Yeah, but I really like this movie. I don't think it's as good as a lot, a lot of the best of Pixar. And like I said, looking back at that 2000s period, like Incredibles and WALL-E, I love those films. But I thought this was just really good, but it's probably not one I'm going to go back and watch a lot. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> this is something that's been uh, a discussion online is is Riley gay 
Um, <laughs> like, there's a big dark secret that she has, and people are thinking that is she gay? <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> I mean, you can just watch the post credit scene. The big dark secrets that revealed there, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> there's a big dark secret that she's keeping hidden. Like, I know the internet have been talking about this that she's gay because she loves the head of the hockey team that she wants to be on. But I don't know. If that's like romantic love that she's feeling or just like admiration for someone she wants to be like i yeah. I, I i think people are reading into that in a in kind of a weird way but i don't know <laughs> there you go pixar made a movie you know who else made a movie chris is that richard link later <laughs> he's made a lot of good films i really like the before trilogy i love school of rock he's a fine filmmaker uh, he made a film called Hitman that is now on Netflix. And this has been a bit of a source of slight controversy because it was given a very, very limited theatrical release. Uh, but it's a it's a really good film. Uh, he co-wrote it with Glenn Powell, the star of the film. Uh, but it's very fun. It, it's kind of a perfect popcorn movie. It, you know, it it's funny. When Glenn Powell is in this and he's he's in Twisters, which we'll talk about in the next episode... And he had the uh, Anyone But You film last year, which most people liked more than I did. But it's like, oh, man, Glenn Powell is the type of person that would become a – he would become a big star in, like, the 90s or 2000s. I mean, he feels like that kind of star to me. Uh, he's very, very charming, like, very, very likable. I mean, obviously, he was in Top Gun Maverick as well. But, yeah, he's really killing it at the moment, and he's really good in this. And this is more of a recommendation than a review, but uh, go watch Hitman. It's very fun to watch uh, Glenn Powell dress up as a bunch of creeps and pretending to be a hitman. And then the romance side of the film is really cool as well. It's like a, a proper, like, sexy romance story. So, yeah, I really liked Hitman. Uh, everyone, go watch it on Netflix. All right, Chris, we've reached the main event. Here we go. We were going to talk about fantasy worlds with great world building and great characters that we want to see more of but we probably never will. Let's talk about Bad Boys 4. Let's do it. <laughs> on. Moving on. Let's talk about Furiosa. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick things off first, because let me ask you this. Uh, besides Fury Road, have you seen any of the other Mad Max movies? I have not. So really it is just kind of Fury Road in this for me. So, yeah. Okay. So this is the interesting thing about Furiosa to me. I mean, obviously, stylistically, it has a lot in common with Fury Road. Uh, the way it looks, uh, obviously, a lot of the characters, they all come from Fury Road. Uh, the first Mad Max film is a revenge film at its core. That's what Furiosa is as well. Then Mad Max 2, you have this lead character who's thrown into this situation. They're a bit of an outsider, and they don't talk a lot. That's Furiosa as well. It's interesting how this feels so much like the first two, and also Fury Road, which which feels so different from those two films as well. It's it's kind of like taking the best of the franchise so far and kind of pumping it into this because the best of the franchise is not Beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> uh, so, what did you think of this? Um, I really liked it. It's pretty much on par with Fury Road, at least for me. Um, I think I like Fury Road just a little bit more than this, but this was still very good. You know, lots of great action set pieces, but this is, like, so similar to Fury Road, but it's also very different. Whereas, like, Fury Road is, like, start, finish. It's basically all one scene, almost. And uh, this is kind of, this is definitely not that, but there's a lot of time jumps, there's a lot that's going on in the movie, and it's a very, very, very solid revenge story. And um, this... As far as I know, this is kind of, like, the only one where they're, like, directly related is Fury Road and Furiosa. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. It's, like, I think this will make, like, a really great back-to-back double feature of how it connects so well to Fury Road. I'm, I'm curious. I want to – do you think you should watch Fury Road first or Furiosa if, if you've never seen these before? If you've never seen – honestly – I would probably do Furiosa first Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, for those that don't know, the way George Miller crafted this movie is that he basically wrote this while he was making Fury Road, which took a very long time for him to make. 
like while he was plotting out the the, the world of Fury Road, he was also writing the Furiosa script. Yeah. Uh, so he basically had this in mind for such a long time that I think playing them back to back really works. Like the character Furiosa and the journey that she goes on. It's interesting how we only get a glimpse of the green place that we heard so much about in Fury Road. Uh, but even though we only see a glimpse of it, that, that moment in Fury Road where she discovers that it's not there anymore, that moment hits even harder now after this journey that we've seen her on in, in this Furiosa film. So yeah. the fact that these two films now complement each other really well, uh, they, they will make for really fun back-to-back viewing at some point. And I did watch them back-to-back, uh, Fury mm-hmm. Road and then Furiosa, like within a day, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, this this is just great. And Anya Taylor-Joy is really, really good in this. Uh, but the young actress as well that plays young Furiosa is really effective as well. Yeah, she's she was in it a lot more than I thought she would be. Yeah, she, she was. Like half the movie, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I guess the performance that a lot of people are pointing to is Chris Hemsworth's because he's nuts in this. Um, mm-hmm. He's so fun and funny for a character that really isn't fun. Like, at the beginning, we see him as this warlord kind of cult leader-esque character and he's really intimidating and then as the film goes along he's kind of more and more silly like when he deems himself the the red dementis and then he wants to become the great dementis and then he's the dark dementis like that stuff is really funny but at the same time when he deems himself the dark dementis he's doing something really really horrible and you really fear for these two characters that we like a lot because he's going to do something terrible to them. And I, I don't totally agree with pe- when people are saying, like, oh, he becomes kind of a joke throughout the film. Like, I don't think that at all. Like, he's still very intimidating, but he's just a lot more flamboyant, I guess, the more we yeah. see him. That, that's, the, that's the great thing is that, like, he's not just another Amorton Joe. And he is in this movie, too. Um, but like, he just brings like a whole nother energy and just a lot of layers behind his character, which is really great. Yeah. I mean, with characters like, um, from previous films, like Master Blaster or Humongous, like this is a universe with very over the top characters. Like the first one as well, Toe Cutter, like he's a totally whack, he's totally wacky as well. Like he fits that vibe really well. And Chris Hemsworth looked like he was having a lot of fun in this. And, And so do a lot of the actors in this. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of talk about how tough it is to shoot these and how, you know, especially on Fury Road and how Charlize Theron and Tom Hardy hated each other and things like that. But I don't know. It seemed like here there, there, there was a lot more enjoyment making this from film from a lot of these guys. And that, at least that's the vibe that I got from it. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you feel about the action sequences in this movie? Um, I thought they were very good. Uh, definitely... Uh, George Miller is very creative with like how he frames his action, and um, even though this isn't th- again, this is very different from Fury Road, which like is is just action from start to finish. Um, the action is like definitely very uh, intentional, not just for pacing, but also just like uh, plot reasons and like where characters go and everything, and um, and just like what happens to a lot of characters in this movie too. So. I really like the action in this a lot. Yeah, I mean, like, that sequence with all these parachutes and the hang gliders and whatnot, like, that sequence is so great. And Mm -hmm. that feels like Fury Road. I mean, Fury Road is basically, as many people know, it's a car chase for the entire movie, practically. So that sequence felt like it was straight out of that. And not only are the visuals so cool, and every time someone explodes, you go, whoa! But you're also really worried for Furiosa, who's hanging underneath the tanker, and you want to see Praetorian Jack survive, and then you end up really liking the character just because just because he's nice, essentially, to mm. our lady. I mean, there's a romance at the heart of it, but it's not a romance that... The type of romance you necessarily would picture in your mind. It's two people who care about each other, who want to help each other succeed more than, like, a romantic sexual romance or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I love these two characters together. Uh, Praetorian Jack is one of those characters that Every time I've seen the film, I've seen it three times now, every time he shows up, it's like, yeah, Praetorian Jack is here. <laughs> He's great. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of Immortan Joe in this? Um, I thought he was pretty good. I See, I haven't seen Fury Road in so long, so that's why it's like, 
I, I remember, you know, what happens in the movie, but I just, you know, I don't really remember if, like, he's on the same level as he was in Fury. I know it's a different actor, um, but, yeah, I thought he was pretty good in this. It was, he was well used in this, I think. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't do anything different in this film to what he does in Fury Road. I mean, he still doesn't give everyone the resources that they should have. He still has his grip on that. He still has all these wives that he's trying to impregnate to have the perfect child or what have you. He, like, he still does all of that. And that's practically all he does in Fury Road. I mean, he, he joins the car chase, but that's what his deal is in that film. So he does the exact same stuff, but because he's not as evil or he's not the, the focus of Furiosa, like, the evil in her life is Dementis. So that's who we see as the big bad. And Immortan Joe is kind of like a means to an end for Furiosa. So, yeah, I, I find that really interesting because he is the lesser of two evils, but he doesn't do anything less or more evil in this film. Um, but man, there's there's so much they could build off with, with this world, and I, I don't want to say that it's hard to imagine there being a Mad Max film without George Miller because this does come from his wild brain, but mm-hmm. I do want to believe that, like, like a Blade Runner 2049, where a good filmmaker could come along and expand on that world and do something really, really good with it. And I want to believe that that's possible. I mean, yeah. I love the idea that these Mad Max films are basically just fables and, like, stories that people tell. And this one obviously has a lot more story to it, but that, that, that still has that feel, like, especially at the end. Like, you have the history man saying that there are many legends about the fate of Dementis, and then we see the uh, one that Furiosa told him. And I mean, visually, it's so weird to look at. And I and I believe people <laughs> pointed this out. I, I need to see the film again to see if this is actually accurate. But I believe that tree is in the place that we see Furiosa and Praetorian Jack with, when they were alone. So I, I think so. That's the vibe I got when I saw it. Yeah, so that adds to her getting her vengeance as well. So that that's just, that's just great. And... Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we can't talk about this movie without talking about its box office, um, mm-hmm. which it, it, it's the weirdest thing to me. Because, I mean, first of all, it, you, have, you have all these people saying, like, uh, oh, we don't want like female leads in these action movies. I mean, first of yeah. all, to say that people don't want to see films with women as the lead, I mean, Barbie was the biggest film in the world last year. But the wildest thing about this to me is people are saying, like, no. We want Mel Gibson back. It's like, what are you talking about? George Miller didn't even want Mel Gibson back, so what does that tell you? Um, well, I have some more to say about the box office. I, I just want to talk about the good stuff first. Um, okay. So uh, George Miller was recently have, uh, did an interview, I believe, with uh, Kojima, and they were having really great discussions about how Kojima would interpret uh, this movie in connection to Fury Road, but it's like some of the things that he was coming up with, George Miller himself did not have that in mind. Like, when you have a world this full, like, people are going to have different interpretations of things like, you know, like, I definitely thought that Praetorian Jack was meant to be a little bit reminiscent of Max, hence why Furiosa feels a certain way eventually about Max and Fury Road. Mm-hmm. But George Miller was like, I didn't really see that until people started bringing it up. So that, that that's an interesting uh, discussion as well. Like, in a general sense, I much more prefer a creative person to say, like, well, that's how you've seen it, then that's not necessarily wrong, as opposed to, no, this is what I intended it to be, that's how it is. Uh, what do you think of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like it when things are kind of left up to interpretation. Um, so, I mean, doesn't... Like, George Miller, obviously, uh, that wasn't his intention, but he didn't really, like, just flat out say, no, that's not what it was like, right? Yeah, no. Like, he was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't think of that, but, I mean, if that's how you saw it, I guess that's not really wrong. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's how I like it, you know? that's um, You leave things open, and, yeah, you can pick up on those things, and you have different outcomes, and that's pretty much just like the movie, really, in terms of, like, the, the fate of Dementis, so, Yeah. Yeah, so is there anything else you want to talk about with um, this movie before we talk about the box office? Uh, I don't think so. All right, so let's talk about the box office. Um, I mentioned Blade Runner 2049 earlier, and that didn't make a lot of money. But much like Fury Road, 
it was the big darling of the Oscars that year, but it didn't make a lot of money. And yeah. it's like, why? Blade Runner is like a really well-known and kind of beloved franchise. It, it's not Indiana Jones, but it's like, I don't know what studios will learn from the box office from Furiosa. I mean, Warner mm-hmm. Brothers marketed the hell out of this movie, and it was pulled from cinemas in like a matter of weeks. Like, it's just a frustrating time. I mean, Bad Boys has made a bunch of money, and the Apes movie did pretty good. So it's it's not like nothing's making money. Like, Bad Boys is like a surprise hit in my mind, but I don't know what we have to learn from all of this. Like, the only guaranteed success, I would think, is like the Deadpool and Wolverine. But I don't know. Like, of the big films coming out in the summertime, like, what is going to be, like, the really big hit? I mean, Inside Out is doing really well right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, but, like, all the Pixar films generally do. Like, post-pandemic, the movies that have made over a billion dollars, I mean, there's uh, Avatar 2, there's Spider-Man No Way Home, Barbie, Super Mario Brothers, so it's, like, recognizable IPs, essentially. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll see how Twister ultimately does in the box office that's just come out, um, but is it is it, like... Is that the trick? Is it legacy sequels with Glenn Powell? Like, is that the trick? <laughs> uh, or is it like our disaster movies back? Are those going to be our money makers? But no, I don't right. think it's that. I think I think it is legacy sequels at this point. Yeah. Um, it, it was kind of weird looking back at like what the most successful films of the year were last year. I mean, obviously everyone knew that Barbie and Oppenheimer were really big, and I don't know if anyone expected Super Mario to be as big as it was. But then it's like, uh, oh, Guardians, right, yeah, of course that did well. And then it's like, uh, oh, Spider-Man did well. But then it's like a lot more of a, of a mixture, which is nice. Like, I'm glad that it's, that it's not just owned by Disney anymore. Uh, Universal last year had a really good year. And even some of the smaller films, like uh, like in Anyone But You, uh, did really well over the Christmas period. So I questioned why that was their holiday season film for Sony. But it ended up doing quite well. It's not like a billion dollars, but it's still still quite well. Yeah. And I think I think that studios need to understand, hopefully, that they don't all have to be enormous successes. Like, you know, the, the level of No Way Home. Uh, what do you have to say about all of that? Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting because it's like, I don't know if I really, I guess I would call Furiosa Legacy, I mean, it's not really a sequel, but a, a legacy movie in the franchise because mm-hmm. it's been almost 10 years since Fury Road, so... Um, it, it is a shame that it, it didn't make that much money. It was just pulled so quickly, but, you know, it's, we got a really great film and I, I can't argue with that. And I'm sure that'll show up in the Oscars just like Fury Road did. So like, yeah. I, I, I can't really complain. I just hope this doesn't mean like we're never going to see, at least from George Miller, we're never going to see one again. I mean, he's getting up there, but like, <laughs> He's, he's still got this talent, and he's still, like, got the energy of, like, a 20-year-old. It's insane when he's making this. But, yeah, that's all I have to say, really. Yeah, you know what's interesting? I thought that we were going to get a lot more R-rated superhero films after Deadpool's success in 2016. Like, mm-hmm. Logan, the following year, was also very successful. But, I mean, The Suicide Squad, which came out during the pandemic, and, you know, Joker was a huge hit as well. It, it's funny that that hasn't really continued, I guess, because, I don't know, like, people talk about how everyone is now sour on superhero films, and that's not really the case. It's just that it's like how things used to be. People are picking and choosing more what they want to see, and if if something gets poorly reviewed, like The Flash, then people don't go out of their way to see it, I guess. Yeah. I felt like Warner Brothers this year were going to, we're going into the year with a lot of different types of movies, and, you know, they have a legacy sequel like Beetlejuice. They're making a sequel to Joker. Uh, but then there's also... Uh, the, the Kevin, are the Kevin Costner American ethics? Like, are those Warner Brothers? I I don't know. But uh, who knows? Yeah, cause but then it, there's... It might not be a thing anymore now. <laughs> yeah, because then there's the Shyamalan movie. So we've got a bunch of different types of movies that they've released. And their first big film of the year, they were like, oh, it's not doing very well, pull it. And it's like, okay, well, not, not that I had any faith in Zaslav, but I was like, at least thinking like, oh, they're at least trying something else, but maybe they're yeah. not. Um, what a sad note to end it on. Uh, Chris, where can people find you? You can find me over on uh, Letterboxd and Instagram. 
Yeah, same here. Uh, you can also find my video editing work over on the Amazing Spider Talks YouTube channel. So check it out, subscribe, watch everything, and we'll see you all next time. I think our next episode will be a discussion of Deadpool and Wolverine. So we'll, we'll have some thoughts there for sure. Hope, hopefully it's good. All right, but we'll see you all next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.